Right, against all odds, I made it into the building. Let's see if we all make it out of the building. Um, right, the internet has come a long way. Probably most of you are very instrumental in making it happen. Uh, we've gone through three generations. Uh, we built a fixed internet, connected every single computer on the planet today. Uh, the mobile internet, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, now 5G. Um, after that, we're now doing the things internet or the internet of things, connecting hopefully every single sensor, actuator, um, object, you know, business processes to that internet. And um, we're in different stages. I think the fixed internet's coming along really well. I think the young generation out there, uh, the kids, uh, they probably just forgot the whole, they just don't know that, that we have a huge infrastructure underpinning what is driving their Snapchats and uh, their Facebooks and all that, which is great, right? Because for us, you remember in the early days, the internet was all about nailing uh, ethernet cables to the walls and connecting them to the uh, routers. You remember those days? Yeah, we had a we had a uh, a browser called what was it? Netscape. Who remembers Netscape in this audience? Oh dear. Okay. So here you go. You don't remember? You didn't have it? No, you do, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, these were the wild days. Today, you ask the kids, they would know. And actually, with uh, with mobile internet, we have achieved that very same transformation, which is remarkable. So as long as your uh, little logo there says 4G uh, and EE, of course, the, it's all good. You actually forget you're in, a, in an untethered type of design. It only, you only start to look on your small logo up there. If it drops to 3G and 2G and you think, oh dear, my operator hasn't upgrade, upgraded the, uh, the infrastructure here, right? So we're almost there. We forgot about that infrastructure in the back. Uh, Internet things still to come a um, long way. Demand hasn't really picked up, but it will happen. But I think it's a good, it's a really good, um, good time what, uh, to ask what's the next internet? Okay, what's the next thing after the fixed mobile and the things internet? And the inspiration to that came about three or four years ago when King's College London, my university, was leading UK's response um, in Sierra Leone at the height of the Ebola crisis. And uh, we got one feedback from the doctors as saying we lack skills. We're not talking about brain surgery skills. We're talking about skills like palpation, uh, taking temperature, just a human being with a human. And I thought, you know, why don't we combine our best telecom skills uh, with our best edge robotic skills and with our best AI skills and build an internet which would allow me to virtualize skills from any point in the world to any other point in the world. And we gave it a name and we called it the Internet of Skills. Okay, the Internet of Skills. I think it was originally in the title. It somehow disappeared halfway through. But uh, So that's what we're building. We're building an Internet of Skills where I can literally uh, virtualize any form of skills from any point in the world to any other point in the world, whether that is uh, somebody teaching me how to paint uh, or I'm teaching somebody how to play the piano or a surgeon doing an operation or we take palpation or uh, Rolls Royce uh, maintaining an engine or Vauxhall repairing a car. Um, we use digital today to negotiate for work but to execute it, we still travel. We still fly, we still take the car. Good question is, what can we do in 10 years' time with the next generation networks? And uh, you may say, hey, we, we're on it, right? And the answer is, we are and we are not. And the inspiration to this came now with the whole discussions around Industry 4.0. You see this here, and probably you're very familiar with that concept. You see manufacturing hall, loads of robots there, loads of sensors, actuators, edge cloud, uh, ultra-low latency communication, fully-fledged, efficient, and eff uh, effective uh, automation hall there. It's just one problem with that picture. Do you see the problem? Where's the human? Where's us? Right? So we're building our own grave here. We're empowering machines uh, to become uh, uh, super good and forgetting that ourselves. And uh, I thought, you know, rather than building Industry 4.0, we should build uh, Human 4.0. We should, we should actually capitalize on the skills we have and allow technology to trans transmit it to any point on the planet. And, and really, the, the tipping point came after I talked to a good friend of mine, Hugh. He's one of the most senior pilots in British Airways. Uh, our kids go to school together, so we had a pint together, and we discussed autonomous flying. And I asked uh, Hugh, why don't we have autonomous airplanes? Because the autopilots are really sophisticated today, and all the rest, like taxiing, takeoff, and all, is super simple. We could have autonomous flying, and we would have had probably 10 times less accidents. And uh, he told Misha, you know, the only reason I'm getting into this cockpit every morning is because if I didn't, nobody would fly. Okay? 
humans uh, love humans and they don't trust machines. And uh, I thought, you know, we need something for, 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 for essentially doing the transition from uh, uh, Industry 4.0 to, to Human 4.0. And uh, I can query you right now, and probably you will give me the standard type of response I get from crowds like yours. Um, and I'll tell you later. I'll ask you the question first. Uh, I want an honest response from you. Imagine you're getting into a Tesla, open the door, sit inside, close the door, turn around, start working, whatever you have to do, or watch Netflix, right? Whilst the car drives you at 50 miles per hour through uh, London, New York, Los Angeles. Who would do that? Okay. My Tesla is waiting outside. We're going to do that. All right? But you see the problem. I could etch that question a bit more. Would you put your kid in there? and have the car drive through the city, right? So I asked that question, my, my, my biggest audience recently was in Los Angeles. Um, all the guys from all the big tech industry actually designing these algorithms, from 4,000 people, 10 hens went up. Do you see the problem, right? So we have a long way to go until autonomous driving is on the road. I have ideas. I work with uh, Transport for London on something which I think will work. And 5G is the underpinning technology. But let's come back to the Internet of Skills. So um, you will say, you know, haptic comms, which is what you need to transmit touch as well as kinesthetic muscle movement, is something we have done before. And the answer is yes, we have. And the answer is no, we haven't. And I want to show you, uh, particularly uh, you as a crowd will understand the, the upper slide and here, the transformation of the Internet. We started uh, really many decades ago with the, our comm skills. And if you're lucky enough, you had a Siemens video phone 50 years ago, and you could use it. But you could only use it if uh, the person you talked to also had a Siemens video phone. Oh, right. During the and, and part of the BD building needs to be rebuilt. No? <laughs> anyway, um, happy to hear that. So all good then. So uh, that transformation. So these were the early days. You could use a video phone. Very expensive. It was a network which was not even circuit switch. It was a human switch, right? So you remember. Some of you may remember these days. And then we did something remarkable over several decades. We came up with IP. You guys came up with that. We flattened the network as long as the device spoke that language. It could connect to the network. But we did something else which was remarkable. We invented codecs. Right? Audio and video codecs. So today, I can take a video on my iPhone and I can play it on my Dell computer. We take that for granted, but really it has transformed our vendor lock-in scenario. So uh, therefore, cost went down, network scaled, the rest is history. So with the haptic networks, we are in the early Siemens video phone days. Um, King's College uses that robot, which you see there. It's a Da Vinci uh, robotic surgery device. Costs two million pounds. Now, you can't build a haptic in and out of skills if uh, the edge devices are so expensive. And the networks, frankly speaking, are not good enough because we need a very low latency to have a fully immersive experience because action and reaction has to happen within 10 milliseconds, right? So we're not fit for purpose yet. And um, we need to do two things, and rather quickly, come up with a really good ultra low latency network, which can do the job from any point in the world to any other point in the world, okay? We're not building a local area network for a manufacturing hall. I'm building here an internet which works from London to Los Angeles to Sydney to Washington to any place on the planet, right? 10 milliseconds, round trip time, that's a challenge. And we need to have codex. I'm not going to talk about the codex today. I just want to let you know that uh, I uh, founded an attribute working group on tactile codex. It was a big challenge because the robotics communities uh, was actually split in those who do touch, the tactile, and those who do uh, kinesthetic muscle, um, kinesthetic movements, so the, the hands and all that. And they didn't want to talk to each other. And I told them, you know, we can't build a, a codec, which is only for one or the other. It's as if we have an MPEG-4, which has no sound. Okay? So they got that in the end. And we are standardizing as we speak, which is at a meeting in Singapore yesterday. If you want to take part of that, please drop me an email. So that's what we want to do, because uh, once we have done that, ultra-low latency network and tactile codecs, 
I hope we can build that standardized Internet of Skills. 5G is an underpinning story there. Now, what is 5G? 5G is both super boring and very exciting at the same time. Why is it boring? Because it follows the very same KPI trend as we had before as we went from 2G, 3G to 4G, right? So if you look at key performance indicators like data rate, number of devices you can connect to a base station, the latency, the outage, etc., it's always an order of magnitude better, right? So there's no, nothing new here. Now, what is new here is though that the KPIs are so powerful, the data rate is so high, the number of IT devices I can connect to the single base station is so high, latency is so low, that suddenly the industry woke up and said, hey, I can use 5G as a platform to deliver some of my industry processes as well, which wasn't there before which wasn't there before. So I predicted at the Mobile World Congress in 2013 that 5G will be as much about consumers as about industries, and that just proved to be right. We have had a lot of interest from the industry on how 5G can be used. Um, what is 5G from a tech point of view? I don't want to go into details, and most of you are probably aware of that, but the biggest transformation is that we managed finally to decouple hardware from software, right? So before you had vendors like Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, Cisco, go to the operators, sell them handcrafted boxes with millions of lines of codes all intertwined uh, and for millions of dollars. Two million dollars, in fact, is what a border router would typically cost. Okay, um, Things have changed now. We decoupled hardware and software, so now we can buy off the shelf best uh, hardware infrastructure you want, um, and we can innovate on the software, which is, of course, much quicker to innovate on. And uh, we also atomized the software, so we separated very clearly the different functionalities. If you want to pull in a distributed ledger technology to do authentication, we can do that today. We couldn't do that with 4G. If uh, you want to use a new handover algorithm, a new security mechanism, we can actually plug this into this new emerging system, which is uh, rather remarkable. Remarkable, um, and it's all been software now. And hopefully, the telco ecosystem will pick up in terms of innovation, like the uh, like, and reach hopefully the, the stage of the internet. And I always say, you know, telco is the last big global ecosystem which goes in generations. If you if you look at the internet, um, you don't see Facebook, Microsoft, and Cisco sit together and come up with uh, a new internet every 10 years, right? You haven't heard of a 5G internet, have you? Right, So because it's totally decoupled. Telcom wasn't, we finally managed to do that, and with that, I hope 5G will be the last G, and we will be innovating in features rather than systems. So let's see whether that will happen in the future. Let's come back to the challenges, and these are challenges that give you as a homework. Um, delay. Clearly, we talked about 10 millisecond round trip delay to any point in the world, right? So the human vortex works on about a 10 millisecond horizon. Many control algorithms do. So let's stick with 10 millisecond, which is one of these boxes here. Different uh, sources of delay, a buffer congestion delay in the network, uh, application delay because you need to compress videos and audio and all that. Uh, you have a serialization delay when you put two cabling technologies together, and you have speed of light. So if you start communicating with, uh, with Paris from here, you have quite a bit of delay in the network and of course a good delay in the application. If you do uh, work with Los Angeles, I work with Hollywood right now quite a lot, that's the delay you get more than 100 milliseconds on the good network of which a good part is speed of light, a uh, substantial part is the network, and uh, the other part is the application, right? So that's where you get your delay ingredients in. So how do we bring that to zero, to 10 milliseconds? Well, first of all, we could use something what we call model-mediated AI. Those in the gaming industry, the Microsofts in the room and others who deal with that, they know of that. So there's a lot of artificial intelligence being used uh, in the gaming industry because if you have a multiplayer cloud gaming uh, exercise and you need to collect the control feedback from everybody around the world, um, you often don't have the time to do that. So you do a lot of predictive analysis of certain players' behavior, and you actually render the game before the control signal has come in. And it's only slight corrective uh, uh, work you do there. So that's what the principle is of uh, model-mediated AI. For many physical tasks, which we want to transmit through the internet, we can buy up to 120 milliseconds. So that field hasn't even fully evolved. We haven't thrown it yet fully at all the intellectual capacity we have on planet Earth, but I see a lot of possibilities there. Now, how do you get off the uh, the buff and congestion delay? Well, we do end-to-end -end slicing, so we reserve highways from, uh, from London to Los Angeles. We can do it today within the operator network to some degree, uh, not really in the transport yet, uh, but let's assume we could do it within a network like EE. Uh, but we can't 
can't do it then on tier three ISPs, and we can't do it back in, uh, in the Verizon network in the United States. So this end-to-end -end orchestration is something which is an open problem which we would love to get solved. Uh, compression, well, the easiest way of getting rid of the compression delay, uh, two ways of doing it, you buy hardware, which is a bit better, and uh, therefore it go, things go quicker, but it's also more expensive. I would like to remind you, I'm trying to build an internet here where the edge has to be cheap. So the idea is not to throw the most expensive equipment here. Uh, the, the idea is to, to build a platform which works with uh, any type of hardware. So the best way of getting rid of the uh, compression delay is not to compress anymore. So if you don't compress anymore, your delay challenge transforms into a bandwidth challenge uh, because suddenly your data rate goes through the roof. So what I'm showing here is a data rate versus the compression time you have. Uh, typically, things happen within 100 milliseconds, 60 millisecond compression, true VR video. If you compress it uh, within these 100 millisecond horizon, you have a data rate of a gigabit per second. If you can't compress it anymore, then suddenly you end up with 10 gig per second. And interestingly, uh, the prediction of Cisco, is anybody from Cisco in the room here by any chance? Yeah, okay, so uh, one person, okay, right, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that because your 25, uh, 2025 traffic predictions of the internet uh, are based on the 100 millisecond horizon. If there's only 1% of the future internet traffic uh, to be real-time traffic where we don't have time to compress, that prediction of the uh, volume of traffic going through the world's internet will go off by an order of magnitude, right? And you want to prepare your infrastructure for that. And I see a lot of real-time applications happening. And uh, these reports probably will be corrected, upwards corrected over the next years. Um, but bandwidth is an issue. So it's the data rate. It's, it's the wireless data rate. Where do we get it on the wireless edge? Well, it turns out we need to look at um, who contributed to capacity most. And there's a chap called Martin Cooper who has... Um who was allegedly the one who did the first mobile phone call from a mobile phone. And he, he sat down recently to understand where did all our capacity come from. So it turns out in the last 35 years, the wireless capacity has improved by a factor of 1 million, of which the physical layer, so the new generations, the 2G to 3G, 4G, et cetera, has contributed by a factor of 5. Uh, Spectrum has contributed by a factor of 25, and ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts. The majority of the capacity, a factor of 1,600, comes simply from smaller cells. Do you believe that? It's true. It's amazing, right? If I, if I want to push you here, it essentially means that we should have used 2G, stopped with all research on 3G, 4G, 5G, 2G, just use all the money to dig more cables, fiber, more roofs. And we would have had probably a capacity increase of 10 million, 100 million. OK, I'll leave that with you. <laughs> and I'm happy to discuss. It's not fully true what I'm saying. I'll leave that challenge with you. But uh, it just shows that the problem is really not the wireless side. It's the whole architecture. How do you build things together? So we worked a lot on the architecture side in my center. We pioneered the concept of decoupled up and down links. So today, when you make a phone call, your up and down link is coming and going from the same base station. We questioned that notion, and we're able to show you have massive uh, capacity advantage by decoupling that. There's a lot of uh, scientific work there. I don't want to bore you all with that. Uh, let me just move on to um, you guys. And that's the, the delay, right? So the latency issue. And uh, Etsy has started to work on the NGN. Is anybody in this room involved in that working group? Can I have some hands? Are you aware of that working group? Yeah? OK. So quite some interesting work um, on next generation networking, the, question, the big question mark about IP in general. And uh, I, want, I just want to show you the slide. In fact, I would like you to give it as a homework. And I don't want any question on this, because I'm not a, you're the guys to answer that question. Um, I want to have answers to that. I just want to show you the table. What I see are the two axes, right? I'm seeing, okay, I'm getting a certain outage in the network, a packet rate loss, okay, uh, PRL, uh, PLR, and I have a certain latency, which we're trying to minim minimize. Um, if I want to run now uh, two different codecs there, so let's say the first one, the upper table, is a, uh, the throughput I require for a 8K ultra high definition video, okay? And of course, there's a trade-off in terms of for a certain network outage, I require a certain latency. So if we look at an outage of 0.01%, then uh, I need about 10 milliseconds for that video to be transmitted. And uh, 
Um, question is, can we push that? Is IP the right answer, or the combination TP, IP, TCP? So this is an IP, TCP response, round trip delay, okay? Um, is that the right answer then? Do we have something off the shelf which actually would work better in the ultra low latency scenarios? We need to buy milliseconds everywhere where we can. Um, any protocol negotiation, of course, gives us a little bit of uh, delay. And I'd be very happy for us to discuss that. That's our biggest headache, right? So from a pure infrastructure point of view, until touching layer three, I think everything is under control. We can do end-to-end -end slicing today, um, on even on layer one today, right? So those who are involved in financial industries, uh, layer one, layer two slicing, no problem. We can do a lot on the application, no compression as an example. But IPTCP, I'd like to have an answer, which is the reason why I agreed to speak here today. <laughs> All right? Because I would like, uh, you guys are very smart with that, uh, to, get, to get an answer here. Okay, uh, keep thinking about this. I'll tell you a little bit where we are today. Our 5G equipment is actually right now being installed on the roofs as we speak in, 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 at the Strand here. Uh, we have um, a new millimeter wave radio, 5G new radio. We have massive MIMO at 3.5 gig and narrowband IT at 700 megahertz, as well as uh, enhanced mobile broadband at 700 megahertz. All goes to a, a core EPC. We have another one on cloud run, another one on hybrid uh, fixed mobile access. I will not go into details. Those who know about this, uh, they will know what that is. The only thing I want to show you is that orchestrator, because it turns out, because we decoupled now 5G so much, much. We have so many degrees of freedom. There's a little box saying, yeah, I want more power, I need more bandwidth. Uh, there's a lot of conflict going on in the network. How do you manage that? No human can do that. So we need a really clever uh, orchestrator, which orchestrates all the resources, and we're working on that within uh, within Kings using artificial intelligence to make that happen. It's quite exciting research, and um, we are currently reaching out to industries. Been doing this for three years. I learned it with a very hard way with uh, one of my companies that no matter how beautiful your technology is, if your final client doesn't understand it, they will not buy it, right? So this transformation from something which is cost-driven, which the telco ecosystem has traditionally been, to something which is value-driven, is something I wanted to do preemptively in the context of 5G. So we reached out to different industries, performing arts industry, very close to my heart, the um, uh, NHS, so the healthcare industry, Kings is pretty good at that, transport, work a lot with Heathrow, uh, Transport for London, um, and network rail, gaming industry, financial industry, you name it. So we have literally spent weeks and months with each of these uh, industries to co-design these systems, uh, starting with a simple question, why would you need 5G? Okay, And ending up often, and actually in all cases, that if you had an ultra-low latency, untethered, uh, ultra-broadband system called 5G, it would fundamentally transform your business, every single one of them. And um, we didn't want to do it on paper, we build it, because I want to make sure that they really understand the value. When this stuff starts to be sold in the year 2020, that they don't question the cost, right? Because they see the value, and we are there. So let me talk to you very quickly for uh, two examples. One is the performing arts world. As I said, very close to my heart. I, um, I uh, posed a very simple question three years ago. I said, could we build something like Netflix, but for the theater world? So the theater world hasn't been disrupted, arguably, since, um, since Shakespeare, 200 years. Okay, maybe the Greeks, 2,000 years, right? It's a, it's a sector which is super creative, zero innovative. So we come in being super innovative, zero creative, and that's the nuclear package which uh, got us going with the National Theatre, Young Vic, Sadler's Well, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. And um, we built this. I hired Ali Hosseini into this project. He's um, a really well-established American artist, works with Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, uh, when I write a huge portfolio. So I hired him into this project, and we interviewed him um, for the, uh, for, you know, why do we need 5G? So I hope the video works. It was embedded. Right, right so I need the, yeah, good. The sound isn't there. We need sound. We really need to come yeah. together. You know, people, they want things to be social, they want it to be interactive. They're not necessarily thinking, oh, I want to see cinema, or I want to see theater, you know, or I want to go to an art gallery. They just want experiences. So as media become more immersive, people are going to merge those different experiences. 
I've been working with King's College London and Ericsson to create a project called Connected Culture. And during the course of this project, we've been looking at different sensory modalities. So we've been looking at the sense of vision, hearing, and touch, and how each of those will be impacted by 5G networks in the future. We've been working to understand how people, artists, and audiences will use networks for performances. So we've been developing new methodologies that are now informing our product development cycle so we can actually bring things to market that will enable people to have access both creatively and for enjoyment and entertainment. 5G infrastructure is critical for the future of Listen to this, very important. I mean, without... Latency. No, no. So, uh, I would Without say. high bandwidth, you can't have a feeling of immersion. You can't have the kind of robust stability that makes people feel like they're in a virtual environment rather than just looking at a screen or, you know, having some disconnected conversation. So imagine being able to take the theater and just fit it over your head or have it projected into your living room. We think that people need high bandwidth, low latency networks to actually have access to experiences that they would have to travel to get before. Right, low latency, immediacy, broad bandwidth, uh, immersive experience. So the other use cases on health, robotic surgery, I'm gonna skip it because we are short of time. Um, you're most welcome to come to King's. I show you this stuff actually, um, and I'll take you to my office. These are my views. I just wanna leave you with one, this last sentence, right? We really hope this is innovative skills underpinned by next generation IP, okay? in the uh, 5G networks and everything we can throw in there will really build these internet skills, enable us to democratize labor the same way as the internet has democratized um, information. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>
Can we, can we agree on the truth? <laughs> I need to pay my 100 people their bills. So. <laughs> um, right. So, well, I, I've just got one quick question. Veronica's asking me. To, <laughs> um, in terms of the sort of transport protocols you were hinting at, are there specific ones you've looked at? Google have recently taken quick to the ITF, for example, mm -hmm. which is sort of UDP-oriented, yeah. zero RTT link right. establishment. Are there protocols like that that you're so particularly looking at? So we haven't looked, looked at quick, actually, but is it, does it, is it like a mixture between UDP and TCP, or? It's, it, it's essentially UDP-based, and it has congestion control. It has zero round-trip time right. connection establishment. Yeah, so the congestion control doesn't worry us too much, because we hope to get, uh, with the software-defined infrastructures, to get these high lanes type of uh, reserve for really critical applications. Now, what worries us is all the protocol handshaking going right. on. And with UDB, the, the disadvantages, we don't know whether the packet has actually arrived. Uh, so, goes on top of that. say again? Sorry, the protocol solves that, that's the whole point. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Just so we have a solution for that? You don't know that the right. got there, but we do TCP on top. Okay. So this is using UDP. Okay. okay, would it solve that then? My problem? It looks like a lunchtime conversation. Yeah, yeah. So we <laughs> yeah. You know, give it to them. Exactly. Answer me the question. Yeah. Is it? Is it? Because the thing is, is um, those that uh, thing you just said you didn't want any questions to be asked about. That seems to me it's actually down to TCP um, because the, there isn't a relationship uh, if you're just sending packets. It's the congestion control algorithm and the uh, how it decides at what rate to send, mm. um, which most designs at the moment can't. Well. Things like Cubic do reasonably well, but uh, they still don't jump to the uh, the high speeds that you're talking about over the okay. long latencies, and that's where the problem lies. So mm. if you don't, if you just send, if you just go bang and just send like a gig or ten gig, without asking, and you have a channel allocated, then I guess you're talking circuit switched mm. approach. But uh, that seems to be where the issue is. I mean, Quick has is similar. It probably uses similar kind of congestion control mm. algorithms, mm. but it's not actually the um, but is it, myo is it a myopic type, or is it like an SDN overlay which, which controls essentially macroscopically where to send the information? But Well, if you've got the SDN, but then you run IP over that and TCP on top of that, and TCP is the issue because it's basically yeah. deciding what rate yeah. to send stuff at, and that can't scale up to those things in that time. So do we need TCP on rate. top? Do we need well, to you kind of need that? it because otherwise you, well, it, it, if you know what speed your traffic is going to be sent at, then... Mm. Uh, then maybe you don't need TCP, mm, which um, we which we do know. But then you generally then we do know. If you want to do <laughs> statistical multiplexing and uh, have uh, capacity sharing, right. then you need some kind of congestion control. Right. The problem is, is the feedback loop is okay. kind of killed a bit by any loss. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So Veronica's kicking me in the shins here. I think we. I know Ian's bursting. Oh, go on, Ian. Just one. You've you deployed IPv6 well, to five million users. You've earned a question. <laughs> uh, that was another life, though. Uh, so uh, a lot of this, especially with the slicing and stuff, mm -hmm. I can see the target of why an application might want that. But actually, a lot of this just sounds like going back to the old days of circuit switch with offline placement. Just it's called SDN now. Uh, do you know why this is going to pan out better than last time it didn't work? Mm. I don't know. Answers, I really don't know. Yeah, and I had a very long chat with the CTO of Nokia on that. And uh, we're, we're not sure. It's a good question. Uh, could you two email me, maybe? Would that be OK? Could you put us in Yeah, there? sure. Yeah, and anybody else who's interested in that. So it's a big question mark there. We've been doing a lot of blind work in there. So any formal support would be great. Can we do that? Great. Thank good. you very much again. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>